to the attendees, um, my name is Stuart Rutledge, and I graduated Ole Miss Law School and did not become a lawyer uh, like Coach Leach. I live in Oxford, and I'm uh, a real estate developer. Coach Leach was generous enough to give us his time um, in conjunction with the Ole Miss Law School's Business and Law Fellowship, which is a, uh, a program within the law school designed for people like Coach Leach and myself who want to go to law school or go, but don't really want to join a law firm. Um, and a bunch of y'all have emailed me during this process to say that you're that kind of person. Um, the format will be pretty simple is that Coach Kiffin's uh, going to do an introduction of Coach Leach, and then Coach Leach will talk all he wants. During the event, there's a QA and a um, feature in Zoom for any of y'all attending. If you do an anonymous one, I won't read your name uh, at the end. If you leave your name on there, I'm going to read your name. So I'll take that as an indication of which way you want it. Um, with that, Coach Kiffin, I'm going to mute myself and turn myself off and hand it off to you. Thanks, Stuart. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, I get an opportunity here to introduce Coach Leach. Um, he's going to tell us how it went from Pepperdine to becoming the winningest coach in the history of Texas Tech. Um, and now <clears throat> across the state there. But um, his bio, his undergrad degree was at BYU, where they were legendary for the passing game there. Then law degree from Pepperdine, where they weren't legendary for passing game. Masters in Sports Science from U.S. Sports Academy. And right out of law school, coach started coaching and went to Kentucky with Hal Mummy and produced the first pick of the draft and Tim Couch. Um, they wrote some questions here for me, I guess I'm supposed to answer. When did you first meet Coach Leach? Um, we were in the Pac-12 together. Uh, he was at Washington State. I was at USC. Um, he did beat me there. Um, which I believe two weeks later I was fired. So technically he is partially responsible for me being fired. Um, we, if I recall right, uh, we combined for one touchdown that day. They scored one, we scored none. So um, that may have been the difference of the degree, having the law degree there versus a recreational administration degree that I have. So um, got great respect for coach. Um, he's always done awesome wherever he's been, um, even when he hasn't had the best players. You know, he's had a million upsets and um, just got the most out of his players, especially offensively. Uh, one of the questions, you know, <clears throat> do you think his law degree benefits in the coaching profession? I think he's going to answer that today, I'm sure. Um, I just know dealing with him at the conference meetings, basically he's just a lot smarter than us football coaches because um, you know, he uses big words that we really don't understand, basically. Um, so excited to hear him tonight. So I think um, you're supposed to say thank you to me first before you start talking, they said, or something like that. Oh, absolutely. I really appreciate it. As a matter of fact, uh, yeah, I, f I first met Monty. And, uh, of course, uh, as a young coach, anytime you meet uh, <clears throat> uh, somebody that's coached as long as Monty has, you feel like you met Elvis. And then in this business, it adds up, and there's a lot of Elvises out there. And then uh, got to know Lane, and, of course, uh, you know, Lane's a dedicated football coach and, uh, and also, uh, you know, one of them that, uh, uh, that I appreciate that when you go to conference meetings, doesn't try to be a Senator and, uh, keep us there too long. So then, um, we can, uh, get out of there and, uh, go, uh, participate in more fulfilling activities from there. And, uh, uh, but anyway, known him for a long time, respected his offense, respected his teams, and uh, and you know, like anybody in this uh, business, uh, we've both uh, survived a lot of bumps and uh, and uh, uh, in the path along the way. So I really appreciate uh, uh, knowing Coach Kiffin and uh, and uh, watching his career as well. Uh, <clears throat> Coach still, Coach still does owe me because we did have a bet for the Egg Bowl, which they just put the trophy back here, I guess, to uh, remind you of that is what our video guy did. And that you were – our deal was um, someone had to fly someone to South You're South not North. You're not quite lined up. you got to scoot that chair over. Scoot that chair over a little this way. <laughs> but uh, you were supposed to pay up with – you have one year 
um, to drop me off in Boca on your way to Key West was supposed to be the deal. Whoever uh, won the game, so we still have about a half a year for you to come through on your bet. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I'm happy to go down there nearly any time, and uh, and uh, you know, and the more we bait the hook around here, the more uh, uh, the more opportunities we may have to get down there because people around here are getting kind of excited to kind of see it. And with that said, um, <clears throat> there's a Ken Burns uh, movie that debuts tonight on uh, 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 PBS on, on, uh, on Ernest Hemingway. So there'll be a lot of, there'll be a lot of South Florida stuff on that for anybody that's interested. And I got it set to record. So, uh, uh, but uh, yeah. No, so uh, well, and uh, congratulations to uh, uh, to Ole Miss in the first uh, Egg Bowl. Uh, but hey, we play it every year. All right, coach. Uh, all yours. All right. Well, I appreciate I appreciate the introduction and I appreciate the uh, the job that uh, uh, that uh, Lane does there at uh, Ole Miss and. Um, uh, well, uh, my background, like a lot of people, I grew up in Cody, Wyoming, where um, uh, you kind of did your own thing. And uh, one thing I always liked about Cody, Wyoming is, uh, you know, you'd think the way you wanted and you had a lot of freedom with regard to that. As a matter of fact, uh, um, uh, and so then the other thing is, is, you know, we were isolated enough that uh, you did... Um, quite a bit of dreaming and trying to think about what it would be like outside of there and, uh, and read books and then uh, eventually have the chance to um, go places and see what, uh, uh, see what it was like there and see if it matched up to what your impression was and, and uh, your imagination. But uh, uh, <clears throat> anyway, I went to, I, when I first went to undergrad, I, uh, I, I uh, decided to, uh, Shortly after high school, I wanted to be an attorney uh, for no real apparent reason. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I was kind of a liberal arts guy and um, and uh, my dad hated attorneys. And uh, we didn't really have any attorneys in my family other than one of my older cousins. <clears throat> and so I went to I went to undergrad at uh, Brigham Young University uh, to be an attorney. I started out in political science. I majored in. American studies so I could take uh, courses I was interested in uh, and I minored in English to sum up I majored in paper writing which I to be honest I didn't mind uh, as I got in the rhythm of it uh, you know what I liked is uh, you could control the argument control the direction control the story and um, uh, and feature uh, the facts uh, that uh, I felt were important and the events that I thought uh, uh, were the most compelling. As a matter of fact, uh, um, you know, I just, I was always kind of a curious guy and always wanted to know a lot about what was going on and I had a lot of interest in a variety of things. And uh, when I was 15 years old, I started coaching Little League Baseball and, uh, and I coached at every uh, level there was to coach. Now that was pretty unusual because it was older people um, that coached uh, baseball and I was playing uh, high school football so I couldn't coach you know youth football but I, I coached Little League Baseball starting when I was 15. You could drive when you were 15 in Wyoming which uh, we can have our uh, that's a whole nether discussion whether it's a good idea for 15 year olds to be driving and um, and uh, so, uh, and I did that through my sophomore year in college. As a matter of fact, uh, I actually took a course in college on baseball coaching in the textbook. The textbook was uh, Ron Polk's uh, book. Actually, I have it right here. He gave me a new autographed copy. So if you want to know about coaching baseball, that's the one right there. You see that? And then, um, so, uh, and then, you know, you, you get the coaching bug. I mean, it's not... Um, you know, there's games you prefer and, and, and games you, you may like better than others, but, you know, coaching's kind of the same thing. You know, it's teaching and taking the resources you have and trying to maximize um, <clears throat> uh, what you can with it, which is a lot like a law brief and uh, addressing a case and, of course, the combat that goes on in the courtroom. 
And so I went straight to law school. I, uh, I graduated in eight semesters and then uh, went straight to law school. And law school, as uh, you guys know by now, is a whole different world. Um, <clears throat> you know, undergrad, you had a little more uh, control over, uh, you know, what you took. You got some subjects that were a little more breathers. In law school, everyone's smart. And, um, and then, uh, uh, you know, as I was going through, I kept thinking about uh, coaching. And, the, you know, the one thing... I thought that, you know, I would, would have a regret if I didn't coach. And so then I'm thinking, well, you know, but I, I like law too, and I wasn't avoiding law. And the reason I went to law school is, um, is uh, you know, I wanted to, you know, fight the battles against uh, the system, the establishment, the, um, you know, for the little guy, uh, make sure that the, the laws, uh, <clears throat> you know, benefited the people. I, in the end, I was, uh, uh, you know, if I had the, the, the perfect setup, I probably would have been a products liability plaintiff's attorney and, uh, and gone after corporations that, uh, uh, you know, kind of abuse uh, the public with, uh, with uh, some of the things that they throw out there and don't stand behind. And, um, but uh, uh, as I was, uh, you know, uh, wondering what I, sh I should do because I was broke. I was broke and married and, uh, and my first daughter, um, uh, you know, she had a little uh, mattress on the floor of a, of a studio apartment in Los Angeles. Now my apartment was a, a, a beautiful apartment which was, uh, 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 looked like a crack house and it had um, uh, bars on the outside window. There was gang graffiti outside and um, uh, and it was uh, it was solidly planted in the barrio, which, uh, to be perfectly honest, I mean, I could talk about uh, how rough it was, but I cherish those memories. I learned a lot from it, and and uh, I enjoyed it because you know the path is all part of it. The path is uh, the most important part of it, and um, so um, <clears throat> and then I could set my clock because we had a pull-out couch where we slept uh, on the, the pull-out bed, and I still have a. Uh, uh, an ache in part of my back sleeping on the bar that went across there. But about 1.30 in the morning, the helicopter that was uh, scouting uh, the rougher neighborhoods to see, you know, what was going on, uh, the spotlight would come right through our window about 1.30 a.m. And, uh, and then, of course, I'd drive to Malibu, and that was quite a contrast between uh, Canoga Park, if you've ever been there, and... Uh, and uh, uh, Malibu, California, where, you know, uh, back then there was uh, J.R. Ewing's, uh, if you ever watch Dallas, his house was down on the beach, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of movie stars, you name them, Michael Land and all these guys, had all these houses on the beach and, uh, you know, Brian Wilson and so many people. And then, um, but as I'm in law school, I'm thinking, well, I don't want to get old and wish I'd coached. And, uh, and, and when I first got in there, I was 22 years old. Me and this guy from Michigan State, we were the youngest guys in the law school. And we were thinking everybody did it that way. But it turns out that, uh, at least in the case of Pepperdine, a lot of them were older. You know, they were CPAs or they'd had a career for a couple years or they were wealthy enough to go to uh, Europe and find themselves. And I did not uh, have the money or the resources to go to Europe and find myself. And, uh, and I didn't, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, and, and things were moving quite fast. And, uh, and me and Kurt, the other young guy, uh, you know, we'd had contracts, we'd heard of contracts, like our phone contract back then, but we'd never, uh, you know, we'd never really done anything with contracts. And, and we both did quite well, maybe because we had a fresh, uh, a fresh slate uh, as far as not being exposed to uh, too much clutter on things. And that's one of the most important things that law can do is remove clutter. Uh, but, um, and so, and then I hadn't totally reconciled wearing the suit every day either. And um, so as I'm thinking about this and what I used to do, is I'd walk into the law school and I'd have all these books and then everybody's got their 
carol where they sit. And, you know, you, some people jealously guard one carol, and that's the only spot that they'll ever sit. And then others will um, kind of a neighborhood. So, you know, I had my little neighborhood. I'd do any carols but this part of the library. And so I'd sit up there, and I thought, well, do I want to go sit in that... Um, a, 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 you know, gloomy sort of four-sided desk, or do I want to? Uh, so I'd sit in uh, uh, downstairs, and pretty soon I'd start reading books that I was interested in. And I read a lot of books on Jerry Spence, and Jerry Spence. I read books on that. My favorites uh, were Melvin Belli and Jerry Spence. Uh, Melvin Belli, famous uh, attorney in San Francisco. As a matter of fact. Uh, He's the one that tried the case. I'm sure you guys probably had it or will have it. Uh, uh, Escola versus uh, Coca-Cola, I think it was. And, um, uh, and it uh, set the precedent of strict liability. And, um, <clears throat> and so then uh, Jerry Spence, of course, was from Wyoming. I'd actually lived in some of the towns he'd lived in growing up. And, you know, so <clears throat> he was the top of... Uh, kind of what I hope to achieve and what I uh, hope to be as an attorney. Um, lived in Jackson, Wyoming, but he'd lived in Sheridan, when, and I lived in Sheridan at one time too. And, then, and so then um, I, uh, uh, as I get to thinking about it, it's like, all right, this guy's arrived and this guy's made it to where I hope to get to. So what is the best, uh, you know, let's get his advice, right? And so I wrote him a letter, and I, and you know, you know, dear uh, dear Mr. Spence, you know, I said, you know, <clears throat> I'm in law school studying uh, to be an attorney, and and uh, you know, like you, uh, I wanted to be uh, a part of uh, doing things that uh, uh, helped society, made things right, that type of thing, and and uh, and protect. Uh, um, <clears throat> you know, smaller entities against uh, big corporations, big insurance, things like that. And, um, and uh, you know, and, and, you know, you've had all these great cases and, you know, you've made it to the top of the profession. And I said, was it, was it worth it? Are you glad you went to law school? Are you glad you're an attorney? If you had it to do over again, would you have done anything else? And Jerry Spence sent me a letter back and it said, it said, yes, uh, I'm glad I went to law school. Uh, 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 yes, I love law, but I also hate law. He says, the bottom line is, and he says, but I would still be an attorney. He says, I am consumed by law. He says, I think about it all the time. He says, uh, uh, he says uh, do something that you're consumed with. He says, if you're consumed um, with law, then go be an attorney. If you're not cons uh, consumed by law, um, go do something that you are consumed with. And I thought about that a lot. And then, so I'm thinking, okay, so what, what's a person consumed by? Well, a person's consumed by what they think about when they're going to the car or when they're, um, uh, going to the refrigerator or looking for the channel changer or, you know, sitting there, you know, what do you think about? And, you know, I was still thinking about coaching an awful lot. And um, <clears throat> so it wasn't some, um, it wasn't a completely defining moment, but it did make me think a lot about uh, the direction that I wanted to go, especially in the more recent future. And this was probably uh, the end of my second year. Um, and I thought, well, I'm not ready to put on the suit, go hang a shingle up right now. Um, I want to, you know, check some things out, do some other things. Because uh, I felt like this going into the professional world was moving awfully fast. And uh, the trouble is, and I, I, I paid, uh, uh, after undergrad, I didn't know anybody anything. I was able to cover it with... Uh, an academic scholarship I had. I worked some, I worked every summer and then I worked some during the school year to make up the rest. So I didn't know anything from there, but Pepperdine, uh, Pepperdine, it, it, it turned out was quite expensive and I owed the federal government uh, $45,000. 
and forty-five thousand dollars may have, may as uh, may as well have been four hundred and fifty million dollars because they were as likely at that point in my life to get forty-five thousand out of me as they were four hundred and fifty million. So then I did uh, uh, you know what students uh, typically do. Um, you know, if they want to adjust, I took out uh, some more student loans and I went and got a master's degree at the United States Sports Academy in particular so that I could finance uh, coaching, you know, for a year or two years. And so as I'm getting my master's um, and the one great thing about the United States Sports Academy, which I definitely recommend, um, is you is part of your degree you can um, get uh, mentorships, internships. Because see, when I got in, it was the p worst possible time to get in as far as being a GA. Um, that was the exact year that they cut the GAs to two. Years ago, they, they went from unlimited GAs, they cut them to just two. And so, you know, anybody would take free help, but the trouble is, is by uh, rule, they weren't allowed to hire me. And so, <clears throat> but I could do a mentorship while getting my degree with the United States Sports Academy. So then I started out um, um, at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which was exciting. I mean, I was starting a whole new career. Uh, I got there right at the tail end of where there were 16 millimeter projectors, where you only had a few copies of the film and guys like me and uh, all night long would be uh, cutting up film, hanging it on the wall, trying not to splice it together backwards. Uh, and it was, uh, it was really fulfilling. I was dead broke. And we were living in student housing, me, my wife, and my daughter. And, um, uh, but I was really enjoying uh, uh, coaching at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo where I was the assistant offensive line coach. And then uh, later coach safeties. Then the next year I went to College of the Desert where I was linebacker coach and uh, it didn't make much money there but made more than at Cal Poly. And then I went to, uh, uh, well then, and I, you know, I've always liked traveling, always wanted to travel. And in uh, the NCAA news, I see an ad, they're looking for a guy to coach in Finland. And, uh, and I'm half Finnish anyway. Actually had relatives over there who we didn't keep in touch with because we didn't speak uh, Finnish, they didn't speak English. But nevertheless, um, uh, went there and they, it's, they, it, they call it semi-pro football, which would be a little bit of a stretch. It's um, basically uh, men's league football. Your team would be ages 15 to 45 maybe and uh, you could have one American on either side of the ball, and you could have an American coach. Well, so anyway, I went over as the American coach, and I, I was thrilled to see Finland, and I was thrilled to, you know, went to Italy on the vacation, and so I was excited about that. And then I went to Iowa Wesleyan College after that, and at Iowa Wesleyan College, uh, that was quite a move for me because, uh, uh, you know, I, I went from... Uh, uh, just basically getting expenses paid, if that, to $13,000 a year in Mount Pleasant, Iowa. And then, uh, but the thing is, you get, you, you, you do get consumed with it. You get excited about it. And, you know, next year, the running back's coming back. Let's see what he can do this year. Well, we're going to be even better on the offensive line next year because I coached offensive line for 10 years. It's still my favorite position. And uh, it's a hard position to coordinate from because it's complicated and there's so many moving parts. But uh, I love coaching O-line. It's still my favorite position. Now, um, every uh, and so then I didn't really decide not to practice law in some kind of a sudden fashion, uh, but I got absorbed in coaching. And, and then there was a point there at Iowa Wesleyan where I felt like, if I could, uh, if, if we could pay our bills and my wife didn't have to work and I wouldn't be in coaching without my wife because, you know, during those hard times, you know, she had to work too, you know? And, um, so I, uh, uh, but I, I'm thinking, you know, if I could afford to make a living at this 
and just make ends meet, uh, then maybe, uh, you know, I, I just lock into coaching, you know, permanently. And then, um, but always I could go back, uh, fall back on law. I could go back and practice law. So there was a sense of security with that. And I'll tell you another thing about graduating from law school. There's no question in, in, in your mind, uh, at least in mine, that I, I felt like uh, I'd accomplished something that not everybody can do. And uh, during uh, tough periods and hard times of my life when we weren't making any money, I felt like uh, uh, I fell back on that. I said, you know, hey, if you can go through law school, you can do this. If you can, uh, you know, if, if you're tough enough to go through law school, you know, this isn't as hard, you know, this is hard, but it's not as hard as law school. And um, so I think it's a great training ground for anything where pressure is going to be applied from a number of directions because, you know, law school kind of majored in pressure. Um, you know, let's be honest. I mean, I don't know if they still do it this way. I assume they do. Um, they, they, you go into class and, you know, they, they of course, make you stand up, you know. Yeah. Mr. Leach, tell us about, you know, and then they'll, they, the, the case, you know, somebody versus somebody else. And so then, you know, and as you start, they'll try to interrupt you. And then they'll say, well, you know, what do you think about this? Well, what do you think about that? And they'll constantly change the hypothetical. And, um, and I actually like that part of it, to be honest with you, you know, uh, stand up and, uh, and, uh, argue and tangle with the professor a little, that did not bother me. Although I do know people that quit law school as a result of that. Um, you know, that, uh, they, they didn't like being barraged by the professors and, and, in contracts, I don't know if they do it like this at, at Ole Miss, and then, uh, but in contracts they'd have the, you know, uh, uh, some kind of an example. Uh, I was the flagpole guy. What the flagpole guy was, some people use a bridge, some uh, contracts classes use a bridge. Um, <clears throat> and Mary Miller, uh, I'll never forget, and she was a great professor and eventually, um, um, well, she became kind of one of my references, actually, even though contracts wasn't uh, exactly one of my stronger classes. Uh, I was the I was the guy where where Mary she'd walk in there and she'd say, "Okay, she, it, it, you know, graduate from Harvard, uh, summa cum laude, all that stuff." So then she says, uh, she says, you know, she says, uh, "This standing up," she says, "That's a little too much." She says, "I don't think we need to stand up." And then, but when it came to questioning uh, students as they were sitting down, I mean, she was an outright barracuda as far as going after you, you know, and uh, which that was kind of fun too. But, um, and I was on the line of fire quite a lot because I was the guy where they said, she'd go, Mr. Leach, if I tell Mr. Leach, if you climb up to the top of the flagpole, I will give you a hundred dollars, you know, and they're trying to teach, obviously offer acceptance consideration, but, um, I will give you a hundred dollars. And then, then they go through all the stuff. You start to climb up. I say, I renege. All right. Now you get over halfway. I say, I renege. Do I owe you a hundred dollars? Okay. You're an inch away from touching the top of the flagpole. Uh, I say, I renege. Do I owe you a hundred dollars? All right. You've touched the top of the flagpole and you begin to make your way down, uh, do I owe you a hundred dollars? I say, I renege, do I owe you a hundred dollars? And, and she would amuse herself for hours, uh, doing that. And, um, and we go back and forth and then, uh, and then of course, uh, one time they had then I, and I don't know if they do this at Ole Miss, but it was pretty common at Pepperdine at one time in the middle of the semester when the first years are really loaded up. <clears throat> you know, around the midterms and whatnot, um, you know, they'd say, well, nobody in here is capable of becoming an attorney and they'd storm out. And I just would start laughing kind of, and I thought that they owed me, you know, offer acceptance consideration. I felt like I was owed some money for that class that they failed to teach, but never really got into that because, you know, at that point, you're just trying to uh, <clears throat> put one foot in front of the other. And uh, the one thing I learned in law, uh, which I use every day, once you go to law school, and I think, uh, 
uh, you're pretty well infected by the end of your first year um, <clears throat> to it'll change the way you think about things uh, forever. I mean, first of all, uh, you know, for the most part, you learn to relentlessly and aggressively debate without being offended by the fact that the other person doesn't agree with you, which I think is a very good lesson. And I definitely think that uh, this country could use more of it, that people can vigorously debate um, without being defended. And then, of course, that allows everybody to, you know, um, <clears throat> balance good ideas with bad ideas and, and hopefully you select the best ideas. But, and so I think that's good. The other thing was, was um, <clears throat> uh, football's a lot like law. I mean, there's, there's more than you can cover. I mean, there's always more work to do. There's always more work to do. There's always more things you could cover. There's always more things you could examine. There's always more things that can be done. But then in your allotted amount of time, um, <clears throat> you have to prioritize. You have to figure out uh, under tremendous pressure and all kinds of time uh, what you're going to select uh, to focus on in the amount of time that you have uh, without overcomplicating things um, to put your best foot forward. And I thought law was... Uh, a tremendous uh, teaching ground for that. And um, the other thing is, is I think law is, is definitely education, but it's also part initiation. And as I got out of law school several years, I began to value some of the initiation part that goes along with it. I mean, you know, football, we're into that too. You know, like uh, we deliberately make practices hard so that under pressure, um, people can respond and learn to respond under pressure. And I, I really think that uh, law school does build that. It does teach that. And um, one professor I had said, a law degree is a problem in problem solving. Um, when you graduate from law school, you will all be better problem solvers than you were when you first got here. And the world has a lot of problems, so go out and solve them. Well, football presents a lot of problems. And then... Uh, <clears throat> um, and so, you know, you know just the, the priorities, prioritizing things, featuring things, organizing things, how um, you're going to put your best foot forward and, uh, and uh, try to make the most of the resources you have. I think law school was great for that. The other thing, uh, at the end of the week, at least during games and things like that, there's a resolution. There's a resolution as far as, okay, how did you do, you know? Uh, maybe your fact pattern wasn't as good as the other uh, person's. Maybe um, your fact pattern was better. Well, how did it come out? And then you can examine, you know, how you did um, because there is going to be some kind of a judgment uh, at the end. And I thought it was beneficial that way. Um, oh, this was funny. Okay, so and I, it's funny because I actually spoke at... Um, Pepperdine's graduation not too long ago, uh, their law school graduation. Um, but I remember my law school graduation. Um, and uh, <coughs> so, uh, so both sides of the family, and they quickly booked that they're going to the graduation because they're afraid that I might uh, not attend the graduation. I'm not a big ceremonial guy, but... Um, um, but it was good to hang out with my classmates one last time and watch them all, you know, we put the robes on together, the whole thing. And then, um, <clears throat> but, uh, so Sharon's parents are there, my parents are there, and, um, <clears throat> and I'd already signed up to go get my master's at the United States Sports Academy. Well, then, of course, uh, uh, you know, as everybody's all happy in the best mood possible, I figure, well, we'll go ahead and break this to them, uh, that I'm going to go get a master's and pursue coaching. Well, and it was priceless to see the expression on their faces um, because, uh, you know, um, well, my mom thought that, uh, um, you know, her son was going to be an attorney right off the bat. Um, <clears throat> my uh, in-laws thought that their daughter was going to be married to an attorney. 
my dad turned, uh, turned around and just uh, walked off and shook his head laughing because he hated attorneys anyway. And um, so, yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, quite an icebreaker there after the graduation when I told him, uh, no, we're going to go ahead and move to Alabama and, uh, and study sports sciences. So anyway, that was kind of the path. And then one year leads to the next. And then um, from uh, Iowa Wesleyan, I went to Valdosta State, where we were there five years. And then that was the when I started breaking even. I couldn't pay back my student loans at that point. Um, and I, uh, uh, I had... I had a few um, profanity-laced conversations with the bill collectors uh, on my student loans over the years. As a matter of fact, it was uh, I could defer them if I took college classes. So a, a certain number of those years, I was coaching. Uh, I'd coach obviously in the fall, and then in the uh, in the in the winter, you know, I would take a class so I could defer my loans. You know, and so then six months on, six months off, so they didn't keep uh, accruing interest. And because um, uh, that's the only way I could do it or to make ends meet and either that or, you know, duck out and disappear, which I thought about that a couple times. And, um, and uh, so by my second year at Texas Tech as head coach, I finally got all those student loans paid and that was a real curse. Uh, because those things hung with me for, oh, geez, let me add this up. So 80, let's see, 86, 96, well, uh, 15 years or so. And so then, um, uh, but when I, uh, from Valdosta State, um, we got hired at the University of Kentucky. And once I got to the University of Kentucky and, uh, and, and did start making a little money, because my old thing was, the coaching thing was great as long as I could afford to do it. And, you know, and, it's, uh, um, and, and I did like college, and I always did like college. And if you think about it, I've never really left college. So um, uh, I discovered I could make a living. And um, uh, so then I thought that uh, I'd probably stick with coaching. But that was, uh, that was quite a while after. That was uh, oh, about... Uh, I graduated from law school in 86, so that would be about uh, uh, 97. So, uh, anyway, any questions? I hope that's not boring, but uh, uh, any questions, let's fire away. All right, Coach, uh, that was wonderful. I know it's kind of weird being silent because there's no clapping or responses. Yeah, nobody laughed at anything. So, I, I it, it, it seemed to me that they found it. Um, and just uh, miserable. It, 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 it was the it was the the, the fun of uh, it was the fun of studying for uh, the finals or something. Yeah. Um, you're obviously a big fan of pirates, and not just in a novelty way. You know a lot about the history, and you uh, you've written a book about the pirate mentality. Uh, but for these students who you're you're speaking to about 130 law students right now, how can the pirate mentality help them both in what career they choose, and then if they become a lawyer. How can it help in that field? Well, if if, uh, if you're interested in more detail in, in my path, um, I I, uh, I wrote a book, Swing Your Sword. And actually, it made it up to number five on New York Times bestseller. But Swing Your Sword is on Amazon, and that's um, kind of my path into coaching and starting uh, when I was a kid. And then, um, and we we're kind of lucky on that on the strength of that. We got to write a book on Geronimo, uh, Geronimo leadership, strategy, uh, leadership Strategies of an American Warrior. And as a kid, I liked Geronimo, read everything I could about Geronimo, and wrote a book. And I'd like to think we put in all the interesting stuff, left out the boring stuff. And, um, and uh, anybody that's got an interest in that, I hope you get it and enjoy it. But... Um, you know, one thing that when I would talk to my team on pirates and the, the pirate thing, you don't have a lot of control over, um, <clears throat> you know, what you're tagged with. And, um, uh, you know, uh, and I've thought about the things I could be tagged with and I've always felt 
that I, I, I came out pretty good because they can tag you with whatever they want. I mean, you know, I went into one stadium one time and this guy was a big man and <clears throat> there were posters and signs up and it says, our coach can eat your coach. Well, I got to thinking this pirate stuff's not so bad after all. And then, <clears throat> but what happened with the pirate stuff, I, <clears throat> I gave a, a speech to our team. We just lost to Missouri. This was back at Texas Tech. And I went out there with uh, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> a real sword. I mean, it was an actual sword. Swords have a funny effect on people. Uh, some of my players wanted to race up and touch it and swing it around as fast as possible. Others would actually kind of steer away from the table as they are walking out. But anyway, so I'm holding that sword saying, you know, and I think this really applies to about anything you do. You know, how are you going to swing your sword? Because, you know, uh, um, <clears throat> pirates were, uh, there's, there's actually, and I'm only halfway through it. There's a good, it's called Pirate Kingdom on uh, Netflix, which it was pretty good, a pretty good uh, summary. Um, but, uh, and I'm halfway through, but, uh, uh, so now it'll probably be a coin flip whether I watch an episode of that or Hemingway tonight. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so... Um, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, how are you going to swing your sword? Well, in football, in football, um, you know, your weapon is your body and you, you sharpen it up in the weight room. You sharpen it up by doing drills. Uh, you sharpen it up, uh, uh, by executing perfectly. Okay. And, uh, just like swinging your sword. I mean, you know, are you going to have good technique? Are you going to ex expose your whole body? So they just stab you in the gut cause you're like this. Are you going to be, you know, uh, just only give them as little of your body as you can. Are, are you going to swing it all timidly? Like, you know, and then they just, they just come in and kill you because you're afraid to watch it. Or are you going to be reckless and out of control, just swinging it all out of control and frantic? Or are you going to execute it where, um, you know, where you have good technique and, you know, uh, do what you practiced. And, and then if you do that, then, um, you're probably going to, uh, play to the best of uh, your ability, play the best you can. And, um, and so, uh, well, how this thing all came to the surface was after I'd given that speech, uh, a year or two later, uh, Michael Lewis came out and Michael Lewis has written a lot of great books, uh, wrote Blindside, wrote, uh, Moneyball, wrote, uh, Meat Market. uh, yeah, wrote the one, uh, he also wrote the the one on the the housing crisis and the basically uh, the financial thing where everybody screwed everybody, and then um, uh, so he came and did an article for on our team in for New York Times Magazine. Hung out for a week, which was awesome because he's hilarious and very fascinating guy. And then um, he. Uh, <clears throat> He interviewed my players, and I'd talked to him about all kinds of things, everything from, you know, World War II to grizzly bears to fishing to the wild dogs of Africa to, uh, um, uh, you know, Civil War stuff, uh, World War II, Daniel Boone, you know, a lot of great, Geronimo for sure. And then, um, but they remembered the pirate speech because of the sword, and... Um, and the, 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 the one thing, and the, 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 the thing that, that uh, on Netflix, it talks about this too, the first, uh, one of the first real democracies uh, was on a pirate ship because <clears throat> a lot of them had defected uh, from uh, the, the various navies, the French, Spanish, or British Navy, which was a very oppressive and abusive life. And then, um, and back then, you know, not only did different countries not get along with one another, different races didn't get along with one another, but in particular, different uh, class system with, with regard to money didn't get along with each other. And so, you know, as these people would gather on pirate ships, it was about, you know, um, who could best get you into treasure and um, uh, one, have your back if you're in a, in a battle, uh, but two, as far as getting into treasure and robbing ships. And so then, um, and they, they, they always signed kind of a, a charter, a contract to be on the ship. One, the captain could be voted out, uh, defined how many shares you got. One interesting thing was there was almost kind of a workman's comp. 
you got a certain amount of an extra share if you lost your left hand compared to your right hand. And even back then, there were more right-handed people because a right hand went for more than a left hand. And then, um, uh, but things were uh, voted on uh, uh, by the crew, which was very unusual back then. And um, so I'd given the speech on pirates. Michael Lewis talked about it uh, in New York Times Magazine, which goes worldwide. And when that happened, I mean, in Lubbock, Texas, flags popped up. I got all kinds of cool pirate books. The band would play, you know, kind of this pirate song. And then our whole team kind of embraced uh, the whole thing a little bit. I mean, we were still mainly, you know, the, mainly the Red Raiders, but, you know. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, so it was, you know, it was kind of fun for everybody. The film tower had a pirate flag on it. And, Got all kinds of cool books, gear. Um, I have a big like uh, uh, skeleton that looks like something off of Pirates of the Caribbean that Bobby Knight and Pat Knight gave me. Uh, Bobby Knight was the head basketball coach then, and uh, and it's pretty cool because you can push a button and that guy will talk to you, and it's got a motion sensor so you can shut the lights off. And so, if your assistants walk in to use the restroom that thing will talk to them and they'll jump and squawk and all that. Speaking of the Cotton Bowl coach, do you remember the 2008 Cotton Bowl? I was there. Were you there? 2008? Yeah, I was there. Yeah, and, his knee, and yes, I was. And, and yes, his, the, the, his knee touched. And that was not a touchdown. And then, and then, and I'll tell you what, to this day, the most bizarre field goal I've ever seen in my entire life. Right above it. Um, back to these law students, uh, a lot of the people that uh, apply or registered to hear you wanted your wisdom on how to get into sports. You know, everybody wants to be a sports agent, uh, but then there's lawyers who want to be coaches, lawyers who want to be in sports law. If they don't want to be a go to a law firm, what should their next step out of law school be to get into sports in general? You know, um, uh, I got an interesting guy, um, and I'd like to talk to him more about it. It just happened. So I had a guy from Blinn Junior College, a guy named Charles Johnson, and, um, and he played for, for us some there at Tech. Uh, you know, wasn't a star, but played for us some. Uh, played one year of arena, <clears throat> and then he got, you know, he just bounced around. The, the most important thing is just refuse to leave. I mean, when you consider, I had no, uh, you know, because in the off seasons, or, uh, I used to substitute teach and, uh, uh, to make, you know, money when you know, I wasn't, uh, had a, a day off or, or could go do it or could do my stuff at night. Um, but Charles just, uh, you know, he, he, he was like an intern with the Rangers. I can't remember his whole path. Rangers, um, I think a women's basketball team, maybe in New Orleans, uh, Yankees. Well, anyway, they just named him the head vice president of uh, the Seattle Mariners. And, and so um, get in there and get some role. Uh, just get, and I, I think there's this about it. Um, uh, whatever level or you want to be at I think you try to get into that level because if you're in that pond you'll get to know contacts within that pond and um, and you'll get to know people and then uh, you know you, you, you want to be a person that um, <clears throat> finds things to do like whatever your role is you want to be inexpendable you know we'll get these GAs and things here and some of them try to figure out how much they can get out of you know how not to do anything you know, like even if you're the guy that makes coffee and gets the sandwiches, you know, volunteer for all of it because there'll be a point where, um, you know, all of a sudden if you're about to leave or you get another opportunity, well, it would be a guy, be a guy that can't do without. Find a way to be a guy that they, they can't do without. And because um, uh, there's a lot of areas. I think that, and the more I've thought about it, and when I was, uh, in law school, I wouldn't have thought about it this way, but I would lead on the fact that you graduate from law school, so you're a great problem solver by definition. And, 
and and then the other thing is 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 you know not everybody on the outside that's not an attorney knows what uh, law uh, law students are capable of or what they can study. I mean, it's kind of like talking to a computer guy. You know, you go to the computer guy. I want all the plays that uh, are like this. That number seven where he touched the ball on the left hash, and 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 you know, early on, I, I'm thinking, oh. You know, I want that, but, and then the guy says, oh, that's easy. All I have to do is sort it this way or that way. I mean, um, if you see ways that you can solve things, uh, <clears throat> explain and illustrate it, because they won't necessarily be the first to think of it. And then I think that um, the marketing is where people could really get in, but you got to be cut out for marketing, I think. Um, uh, everybody's looking for marketing, and nowadays sports with, it, it's it's grown and grown and grown. Like I mean, like you got everything from uh, well, sports betting, uh, fantasy football. I mean, so it's even going you know outside of the particular league or whatever, you know. And then um, uh, I mean, there's just so many things. Or you you know if you if you get in the um, and that basically what I did is. I uh, went in and just refused to leave, but I was determined to be a coach, you know, and, you know, if it would elevate my uh, career, not and not just elevate the career, but in particular, me learn more. I mean, just become as good at your, um, what you want to do as possible, as good at your craft as possible. I hate that description, but people like that. It just sounds, it could get as good at your craft as possible. It just seems... Well, it seems like I'm sitting here cross-stitching, and, um, and, and, then, and then, which, which um, doesn't encompass the, uh, the, the aggression, the determination, the, the grind that exists with succeeding at something, you know? But, uh, um, you know, and one of the great quotes I always try to remind myself, uh, it's what you learn after you know everything that counts. I mean, you've got to keep studying, you've got to keep searching, you, you've got to keep digging. And then, um, <clears throat> um, uh, but there's, I, I would try to figure out what your interest level is. Is it writing something? Is it, like here's one, Clay Travis. Okay, Clay Travis, law grad, okay, starts doing the radio. Uh, the podcast that grows, grows, got to be bigger, 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 you know. And, and, and um, uh, I don't know if if they went to law school, but another example is kind of those barstool sports guys, you know. And then, um, and uh, I think that that that. But I, 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 there's a you got to somehow narrow it down, figure out what you're really interested in, what you're really good at, and then try to figure out your aspect of sports with regard to that. Now, an agent, <clears throat> an agent's more of an attorney than a than a sports guy you know an agent um uh if if he's not an attorney already he's gonna or, or they're gonna have an attorney you know he or she's gonna have an attorney if they're not already an attorney and and that's they're gonna run things through but that's kind of contracts and in, in practicing law really is what that is you know uh mar marketing meets law is sort of what that is uh Tony Larusa, I think, is another uh, lawyer who's a coach. Other than y'all two, can you think of any other uh, JDs who are coaching at a major level? Uh, Bill Walton is, uh, but he's not coaching really. Uh, let's see, Tony Larusa. There is another. There is a. Uh, I'd have to think about that. Well, I'll just sit here and stammer and try to think. But there, I think there are a couple others. Well, uh, we've been here about an hour. I don't want to take too much of your time. I know you got to go to uh, spring practice. I guess y'all are sitting. I'm going to close with one last question, which would be, um, and it's, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, but uh, for our next speaker uh, about someone talking about a law degree or using law school to not be a lawyer, who would you recommend? Who would you pick? Who would I pick? For the next speaker in this series, to follow oh. Mike Leach. Oh, I'll tell you who'd be hilarious if he if he'd do it. Well, I, I think he's like like first of all, you know, 
there's people out there that don't like Bill Walton, okay? Now, I don't know him, oh, I, but I will tell you this. I was in San Diego one time. Uh, I was in San Diego one time. My wife's from San Diego, okay? And I'm walking down uh, Mission Beach, right? And all of a sudden I see, and it's kind of crowded. I see the biggest bicycle I've ever seen. And I'm thinking it's like a trick bicycle or like some, you know, like those, yeah, it's like a bicycle, but like one of those really high old timey bicycles. But you know, then I see a, then I see a helmet and there's red hair coming out of the helmet. It's a damn, it's Bill Walton weaving between people. I, I, well, it would be interesting to be, well, first of all, he's interesting to talk to no matter what. And then, um, and then those that get their feelings hurt too bad by him. I think they're just babies, but, um, uh, oh, I think he'd be hilarious to listen to, uh, Tony LaRussa and I've never met Tony LaRussa, but, uh, the, uh, you know, Pat Knight knows him. Uh, I think he'd be outstanding. Um, there's a few that have kind of, you know, like, um, there's a few, um, like major league, uh, uh, players and, and NFL players that later on go and become attorneys. Oh, uh, Steve Young's an attorney. Um, uh, Alan Page uh, is a Supreme Court justice, or uh, uh, was a Supreme Court justice uh, for the state of Minnesota. Um, you know, uh, remember where the the Purple People Eaters? Uh, that was that was him. All right, and then. Um, uh, you know, there's some out there, and I think it would be pretty interesting. Um, Tell Dave, uh, as you think of them, send them on. Uh, those are great ideas. But uh, I think uh, we've taken enough of your time. We could sit here forever, but I know you got better things to do. Uh, again, on behalf of the Ole Miss Law School and the Business and Law Fellowship Program, we really appreciate you doing this, Coach. And I, in my little experience with coaches, not only would not all coaches do this, but not many would do this and it's because you're a lifelong learner and we can tell you love to teach and we we really really appreciate you joining us today well thanks so much for having me uh give lane my best uh and then um and uh there i'll tell you there's a a, a number of uh there's a number of uh <clears throat> mississippi state grads there so uh sure. you know um don't uh, let them indoctrinate you don't uh don't indoctrinate them, you know, don't, don't, don't infect them. We won't. Well, I hope you have a great day and uh, maybe we'll be able to do something like this again. Oh, I'd be happy to. All right. See you coach. All right. Thanks. For the rest of y'all, I'm disconnecting.